Uh, hi, everyone, and welcome. My name is Lucy. Um, I'm the head of community at Omdena. Uh, welcome to Learner's Spotlight, my journey into AI. So this event is co-hosted by Deep Learning AI and Omdena. Um, just to give you a little background, Omdena is a bottom-up collaborative AI development platform um, where change makers from all over the world come together um, to build ethical and efficient AI solutions for some of the world's most pressing problems um, with NGOs, uh, social enterprises, and, and impact-driven startups um, globally. So I'm really excited to be here today facilitating the event and representing uh, Omdena and our community. Um, today, we've assembled a panel of machine learning practitioners from different backgrounds um, as they share firsthand experiences in building a career. Um, this event is designed for AI beginners, so hopefully you'll walk away with a, um, with a better understanding and some practical career guidance um, and inspiration for your next steps in your career. Uh, you can also find a list of topics that we'll be covering in the description box below the video. Um, and after the panel discussion, we'll be taking questions from you uh, via Slido. Um, so make sure that if you have signed up for the Slido ticket uh, to check your email for the access link to post and um, upvote your questions so that they can get answered. Um, so now without further ado, I'd like to welcome our panel today. Uh, we have Farhad Sadeglo, who's a lead machine learning engineer at Omdena. We have Gianna Park, who's a software engineer and a poet. Uh, we have Sarah El Atiev, who's a PhD student at NCS in Morocco. Um, and we also have Madhu Charan, who's an undergraduate at Sastra University in India. And he's also a junior coach at UN School. So welcome, guys. Um, and also, just logistically, for the next 40 minutes or so, I'll be asking some questions to our panelists. Um, while I'll direct some, so I'll direct some of the questions to the panelists, but um, you guys feel free to jump in um, and offer your input into the uh, conversation. Um, so let's start off with a brief introduction, uh, introduction from everyone. Um, if you want to go ahead and, and introduce yourself, we can start with Gianna. Sure. Thanks, Lucy. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Gianna. It's really nice to be here. Um, I studied psychology and creative writing. And then more recently, I graduated from a coding boot camp to become a software engineer. And last month, I started working at Bloomberg and just wanted to make a quick note that everything that I'll be sharing today is my personal views and my companies. And with that being said, I'm very happy to be here. Welcome. Sarah, if you want to go next. Yeah, sure. So hello, everyone. First, thank you for inviting me to this amazing event. Then I am Sarah Latif, and I graduated from Ensof El Jadida from Morocco as a computer science and emerging technologies engineer. And I am currently doing my PhD at NCS in machine learning applied to healthcare. Awesome. Madhu? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Madhu Charan. Uh, I'm an undergraduate student from India. Uh, I've been learning and working in, a, in the AI field for the past one year, and I'm an ML engineer at Omdena, and uh, I've been mentoring uh, my fellow students at Unschool, uh, and it's an e-learning platform, and I'm happy to be here to answer all your questions. Uh, thank you. All right, and Farhad, finally. Hello everyone, my name is Farhad and uh, I'm one of the Omdeno collaborators who have joined Omdeno over a year ago and uh, grad could uh, become a lead machine learning engineer in less than a year. And uh, my background is mechanical engineering and uh, mechatronics engineering and uh, currently it's about a couple of years that um, about three years that I've switched to um, um, data science and machine learning with uh, programming. Thank you. I hope I can answer all of your questions. Thank you, thank you. All right, so it uh, looks like we have a very interesting panel um, here today. So I would love to just jump into the question. So maybe I'm gonna start with a question for all of you. Um, which is how did you get interested in AI and how did you decide which fields in AI to focus on? 
We can start with, with Gianna, let's say. Okay. Um, sure, I can talk about how I got interested in AI in the first place. So I actually first heard about uh, natural language processing while I was still in the coding bootcamp last year. And I came across an article written by an LM of the bootcamp that explained how a music recommendation system works based on several mechanisms, but one of them was based on word embeddings and text similarity. And as a writer and as a poet, that notion of translating words into numbers and representing uh, semantic relationships with numbers was just super fascinating to me. It wasn't my first exposure to AI, but my first exposure to, it was my first exposure to NLP. And before that, when I was thinking about AI, it felt like some vague distant future that had little to do with my day-to-day -day life. But after the, reading the article, uh, about word embeddings, um, that article kind of made AI relevant for me, which led me to want to learn more about the field in general, and of course, particularly the field of NLP because of my personal connections to language. Awesome, whoever wants to go next, let's have a conversation about it. Does someone have a similar experience as Gianna or completely different? I, I, can, like, I can share my story. So I remember, so like the first time I got really interested was when we had like in uh, in my second engineering year, usually we have to choose like what option we want to continue on. So there was like big data, IoT, then software development as a whole. And I was actually at the time, there were lots and lots of articles about big data. And I was really interested to know what is this big data? Like what is it all about? And then I searched and then I stumbled upon, you know, like lots of resources at that time. And my friend who was interested about it, like before me, had already started several MOOCs online. And then he was always like telling me what he was learning. And from him, I learned, you know, like I learned what are the best courses that I could start with. That's how I got started, you know, like through data camp and then going over several courses. And finally, I stumbled upon Stanford's machine learning, you know, like the best course that everyone tries to go to first. So that was the one that really hooked me and got me into the field. All right, cool. So Gianna has a little personal connection to NLP and she, you know, she kind of kind of thought about her past experiences and, and found a way to contribute and I guess, sorry, you were motivated by friends of yours who were interested in the field first. What about you guys, Madhu and Farhad? Um, I got, um, because uh, I got to into, into this field because I had previous uh, exposure and experience with their daughter. And it was about predictive maintenance and uh, vibration in vibration and industrial machine, uh, machines vibration analysis. And, uh, it was a really great experience for me to um, get into this field. I wanted to change my field from what I had before to something um, in relation with kind of programming uh, opportunity. And as I had the experience with data, I searched about uh, how what's the closest um, field to that. And I found that data science and machine learning are the closest one. And I really enjoy them because of the this kind of opportunity for prediction and uh, predicting and providing future uh, future results, uh, I mean, uh, making predictions about what would happen in the future kind of opportunity. That's really great. Um, that was really great for me and I hope you can enjoy it too. Uh, so mine was some of a kind of different story. So uh, 14 months ago, uh, before this COVID-19 situation, uh, we, I, with a group of uh, three, three more friends uh, were participating in a hackathon where we had to implement a solution for uh, the, gov uh, the government. Uh, the district collector were proposed a, uh, a challenge to actually to provide a solution uh, to the, like one of the biggest problem in India that is malnutrition for in children to, to find a way to eradicate that. So everyone was uh, implementing some apps and some websites and uh, we didn't know anything. We, we know app development, but we wanted to 
really do something about it and we started researching about it we uh, we consulted some of the doctors and we made our own formula to actually uh, identify uh, the the severity of malnutrition on a scale of 1 to 10 and then we got, we were afraid that uh, how credible that will be because uh, it depends on uh, entirely on what the researcher does uh, like to give weightage to a particular features or something and we searched about it and we got to know there is something called machine learning Uh, which does this complex uh, analysis tasks and give out these predictions and then i i started with deep learning.ai stanford machine learning course uh, we implemented this machine learning based solution and a recommender system and uh, and then i thought like i wanted to continue this uh, i was very interested in learning and further continuing it and that's how my journey has started uh, into a Cool, cool. So it seems like you all have one thing in common. You all were very curious um, for some reason, and and that's why you jumped into the field. So um, this kind of leads me to my second question, which is Sarah already answered. So she started the first course that she got into was the machine learning from Stanford. Um, so Farhad, I guess uh, my I'll direct this question to you. How did you get started in terms of courses is there like a certain curriculum that you started what types of projects did you do first how was that first uh, initial thing into the field well i did it um, from a kind of um, way to understand what's going on in the ai field so i started by volunteering for companies seminars uh, in for the seminars and opportunities which provide with uh, collaboration and co- cooperating with companies and uh, i found that there are a lot of opportunities in this field so um and the, that and those in those seminars was uh, that i joined uh, they did change my life for forever two of the most companies that i got introduced with was lantern institute which i um, which i got the classes and the courses with them and it was really awesome uh, it was some it was a really awesome opportunity for me and uh, the another co- company was omdena that i got introduced with uh, the ceo um, the ceo and the founder of the company rudra mitro mitro and uh, he was really a uh, great uh, guy and i thought that i i really uh, this guy is the, can be the future i mean this can, guy can um, does manage the company which i'm really happy with and i really I would, it would be really awesome for me to work for him and uh, uh, that's that's me that's how i got it into this uh, field and uh, one of the main projects that i i mean first projects that i did was prediction on housing markets and um, it was really awesome opportunity um, and also prediction on um, employees churn if they would churn <laughs> and um, the main one of the main um, fields that the one needs to start with this in this field is statistics and understanding about um sample or population data or fundamentals of descriptive and uh, descriptive statistics and different types of uh, distributions and central limit theorem and hypothesis and testing and uh, in, in machine learning topics uh, there are a lot of topics that uh, one can start with but uh, i would suggest starting with na- um, artificial na- neural networks and uh, providing uh, i mean understanding what's the forward propagation backward pro- propagation and uh, provide understanding linear regression um, and the multi multi uh, multi layer networks and feed forward networks uh, or fitting concepts and also activation fun- functions batch normalization gradient clipping and faster optimizers model evaluation and concepts like that and uh, mm-hmm. with all having all of these and knowing all of these you can fairly provide a kind of model for yourself to predict uh, to do a kind of prediction on a data set and uh, it's really awesome it's really awesome 
Oh, cool. And and what about what about you, Madhu? So I know you first got introduced uh, through your project, um, but are there any other courses or curriculums that you um, that did afterwards afterwards perhaps that helped you? Yeah. So uh, as I said, uh, I started with the Stanford's machine learning course, and uh, it was in uh, MATLAB. So I wanted to do it in Python. So I quickly took the uh, I jumped into deep learning as well. Uh, through deep learning specialization and uh, it was in tensorflow one uh, but uh, it got updated recently so congratulations to you guys who are going to learn it uh, from now and uh, uh, i wanted to learn something like which was uh, updated so i took udacity's deep learning nano degree uh, suggested by one of uh, the omdina collaborator so i took that uh, and then I started doing all the projects mentioned there. Uh, but uh, before going dive, uh, deep dive into this deep learning field, I, I concentrated on statistics and mathematics as well, uh, because most of the deep learning and machine learning concepts uh, are th the mathematics, uh, which is underlying under them, will, will give a better intuition if we concentrate on them. Uh, I don't suggest going through solving all these uh, uh, like this. Uh, all the mo models, uh, what is the underlying uh, mathematics behind them, but understanding is uh, what I would suggest. Uh, and uh, these questions uh, helped me to understand the mathematics. And then uh, I did uh, some basic projects uh, through Kaggle data sets. And uh, I wanted to really get into some exciting project. And then I found Omdena at that time, uh, which was really challenging. Uh, for me uh, at that time and I took it as a challenge to actually get into real world like how it works and all so uh, that was uh, my journey so oh, there's cool. one thing I would like to add before you go on Lucy is that you know as a beginners there is something that we try to avoid and that is learning how to pre-process and clean data while it is like the most important part because like all the data scientists say they spend over 60 to 70% just cleaning the data and getting it into the right shape. So it's really, you know, like really important to start with that. And I found that like so far, the best course that really teached me that was the data comp courses, you know, the data science for Python ones. They really, really stress on several, you know, like processes on how you can clean your data in different ways. Ah, and would you say would you say it's uh, it's more important to understand that or get a good grasp of data and cleaning it rather than getting into the math and statistics and all of that before? No, I would say try to get a bit of everything. Like this is how you usually to get the best of something. Like for example, the 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 thing for example that I found out that my friends like it to do, like because me I like to get into the theoretical part, but for example. When, when they want to, to, you know, start, what they do is they start with a project, for example, then they go over it and each time they come across something they've just found new, they go search for it and learn about it and then they move on. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, cool. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and I guess one other, one question that I would have um, to Gianna, actually, because, you know, she, you gave a little bit of background behind how you transitioned, how you drew parallels between your previous um, experience and this new data science field and AI field. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, for others transitioning into AI from a different field, um, how, how would you suggest for them to get started? How to draw those parallels? Mm, great. So I'm going to refer phrase the question a little bit because I'm speaking from a slightly different position here where um, where I'm talking where, where I am interested in AI as someone who is open to but not necessarily actively seeking to transition or seek a professional position there but with that being said my personal journey was I so during the bootcamp, when I first learned about word embeddings and first got interested in NLP, I just started off by reading a lot of articles on Medium, mostly towards data science, which is a great publication where you get to 
taste a little bit of everything about statistics, data science, NLP, other ML topics. Um, that was a good starting point. And after the boot camp, I enrolled in Deep Learning AI's NLP specialization course. Um, and I had audited another course by Deep Learning called AI for Everyone um, about a couple of years ago out of curiosity. And I think I saw that ad on social media. And I just really appreciated the teaching style and how, the, how they explained the materials in a very accessible way. So in, in those courses, you get to do guided assignments where you can try and implement algorithms that were covered that week or um, things like that. And those hands-on exercises really helped me feel grounded and um, solidify learning. So after I enrolled in, enrolled in that course, I got invited to join a Slack community of deep learning AI, where you could just ask questions about the course materials or just hang out. And because I didn't know anyone who was working in that field, I tried to go to as many meetups and events as I could when possible, just to hear from other people, um, their stories, um, how they got started, what AI was all about for them, uh, what projects they're working on, and what are some possible applications and use cases and so on. So those events were crucial for me in helping me understand the context where I could put the things that I was learning into perspective. And it was one of those meetups uh, by Deep Learning uh, called Pi and AI. And I think maybe Mo is currently in this listening to this event. And uh, thank you, Mo, for uh, organizing a lot of the great events. Um, I first heard about Omdena in one of those events. And I thought it was such a great thing that you, Lucy, and others at Omdena were doing, which is connecting people from around the world to solve problems that had real world impact. And so the one project that I did with Omdena was using NLP to help alleviate the administrative burden of social workers at a nonprofit. And the reason why I chose to participate in this project was because I have worked at a nonprofit before and understood some of the pain points often experienced by social workers. And the goal of the project was a sort of change that I had wished that I had seen while I was working at that nonprofit, but didn't yet know how to bring about those changes. I didn't have the knowledge or skill set to implement those changes. So it was a really exciting opportunity for me to um, bring in both my past experience and the newfound knowledge and skills and see what was possible now. Um, let's see. I don't know about you guys, but for this project, we didn't have any, we didn't have a clean data set. We didn't have much data to work with in the beginning. So we got to experience the whole pipeline of gathering data, deciding even what kind of data to collect um, and then pre-processing it. Sarah, you were on point in saying that this is a super, super important uh, process. Um, and then either building a model or finding what other pre-trained models were out there that we could use. Um, and then finally, delivering the outcome in a way that our stakeholders, uh, who may not have the technical background, could understand easily. And uh, Farad, you mentioned the, the statistics and all these important things to learn. Uh, but for me, it was slightly different. When this project began, I was only halfway through the NLP specialization course, and maybe I had some pretty good grasp on like word embeddings and a few basic things, but that was about it. Um, but what was great about this project was that there were around 40 people uh, working together from different backgrounds. And we were all just learning as we went. Uh, we would look up things, if things like new tools or topics came up, we would ask on Slack openly and someone who had more experience with that would comment on that and we would just open discussion all the time. So that was a really good experience in not only learning about the topics of NLP by doing it, but also practicing teamwork and leadership and time management and all that. Uh, so yeah, that was my experience. I started by taking the course on my own, but as soon as I started getting involved uh, and getting myself out there to be around other people who are already doing the work um, and finding opportunities to collaborate with them, um, that's when I learned the most within the shortest time. 
Nice. Thanks. Thanks for sharing your story. Yeah. So it seems like, you know, you all chose, uh, you learn through the courses, but then a very important aspect of it is then applying it to real world problems and really getting out there and doing the work that maybe not everyone wants to do, like the data pre-processing, but you know, that's, that's probably the biggest part of the job. Um, I'm going to jump a little bit forward. So now we know kind of, you know, how to get started and, and it seems there's a bit of a trend between all of you guys. Um, but Sarah and Madhu, I know that um, the two of you have been actively mentoring AI enthusiasts and students. Um, and that's why I want to ask, how important would you say is having a mentor in the AI field? Um, how important is it to help with the learning? And where can you find mentors? Yeah, so uh, I, when I started, I didn't have any mentor. Uh, all I had is time mm, due to this COVID-19. Uh, I had a plenty of time, so I just started it off. But soon after, I realized it, uh, I'm going in a wrong way. Like, uh, it's not only courses. Uh, it's about applying what I have learned. Uh, so what I did was... Uh, I was looking for some Slack groups, like what Gianna has uh, done uh, after doing deep learning .a specialization. Uh, I have joined some Slack groups. Uh, there are very, really an interesting and very active community uh, out there. We just have to search for it. If, uh, if it is not possible, uh, we just need to find someone uh, who can actually, uh, if they are not available for mentoring, even, uh, like uh, learning, uh, co-learning kind of thing. So uh, I directly, uh, uh, I was uh, going through the LinkedIn feed uh, and I found two to three friends um, like who were active uh, in the machine learning field. And I just DM them uh, like uh, whether they are available for uh, like co-learning. Uh, co so they said, yeah, they are. So, and then we started discussing on WhatsApp groups and uh, uh, we created a WhatsApp group and uh, we have uh, learned uh, learned on the grow. And soon after that, uh, I realized that having a mentor has given me uh, a very large uh, amount of boost to actually improve uh, within a shorter span of time. Because um, AI is something, uh, a, a different field. Uh, I realized that I have something to give it to some other person and I can take some knowledge from other other person not uh, like everyone has some part of the ai which they are uh, specialized in it so like my interest lies in computer vision uh, and um, one of my uh, friends uh, interest is in nlp so we were learning uh, so and he has also become a member of omdina later uh, yeah so and after that um, uh, on LinkedIn, uh, a guy actually gathered all the people, uh, uh, almost 250 people uh, into a WhatsApp group. Uh, that was the major uh, like effect uh, in my journey uh, because uh, it was very active. He, ma uh, he maintained it very well and um, everyone is an AI enthusiast there. So he, uh, we were act uh, actively sharing and helping each other. So having a mentor will definitely boost uh, your journey. And now I am mentoring others like uh, with patience. And so, yes. What about you, Sarah? So it seems like all you have to do is ask for help and then and then yeah. doors will open. <laughs> what about you, yeah, Sarah? Definitely. So similar to Madhu, for me as well, I didn't have a mentor. But the thing that helped me a lot was the fact that my friend already was trying several courses before me. So he was always giving me feedback, like, for example, don't start like this and start like that. So from time to time, he helped me shape, you know, like the, the way to, to, to actually learn and find my way out. But the thing that, I mean, apart from, of course, the, the you know, like the, the, the things I learned from as well, like the mistakes I made, the things, for example, I shouldn't have like started with this or started with that, or, you know, go for this course, it was too advanced or something like that. What I actually do right now is try to help others, you know, like understand like what they can start with. Because for example, when I do workshops, like for example, I'm exploring my workshops or any kind of, of talk I give, always people at the end come to me like, how did you start with this? Like, how can I, for example, learn this? What do I need to start with so I can 
you know, like know or, or do deep learning, for example, or do machine learning or even data science. So it is true, of course, this, you know, these mistakes I made before and my, my friends learning that actually give advices like that. So like Madhu said, what actually a mentor can give you is a boost. Like for example, instead of thinking one year, you could think, for example, six months or less if you have a mentor. Now, let's say for example, it's really difficult to find a mentor, especially someone who can really help you out. So what I suggest always is to try and get involved with different communities. And there are a lot of amazing you know, opportunities where you can get involved. For example, Omdena always has lots of challenges every month. So this is like the opportunity to learn from other people that are more advanced than you in skills. And then, you know, like build up in other people's knowledge and make your own actual curriculum. Cool. And, and where, where do you find these people? So in Madhu's case, he said LinkedIn was the place for him. What about for you? So for me, like I, I usually like try and go around and see what other people are doing. For example, let's say, you know, like the, 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 the big people, what we call founders of AI. Like, for example, I try to see what they suggest to do in LinkedIn, for example, or I try to read Medium articles from other people and see what they suggest will be a good, you know, good, good starting point. And then I try it as well and see if it's really a good starting point for not or or, you know, for me or not as well. And then, of course, I, I fine tune every time until I learn what I need. But for example, the thing that the thing that is great is that if you can ask people around, like communities, you know, there are lots of communities everywhere around the world, either in machine learning in or programming or anything, always try to go to the these small ends and learn from other people that are more advanced than you. So this is like most of the, the knowledge I got. I got this, of course, from other people. Okay, cool, cool. And um, I also want to ask a question that probably some people are dreading or asking themselves. And Farhad, I'd probably want to ask you that one first is to what extent ha is having a master's or PhD degree important in getting a job in the AI ML field? Coming from someone who has that, you might have some perspective. And I guess, uh, I'm, I mean, I believe it's really important because of uh, in this field, you would, need, you would have a lot of challenges, a lot of uh, problems to solve. And the more challenges and the problems that we have solved in the past and the ex more experience that you have in the past would uh, help you a lot in solving the future challenges that you would face. And uh, in this field, um, you need to be a self-learner, um, a complete self-learner to be uh, the high, at the highest um, rate of the best uh, people in this field. So you would need to, um, I mean, if the only person on earth is you, you should be able to uh, do this opportunity as well. I mean, by all means without any help from anyone. And you should be able to read alt articles, um, papers, uh, academic academic ones, definitely, <laughs> and the textbooks. And uh, you should be able to use any material that is out there. And also you need to uh, know that um, in addition to this question, one of the answers that I remember from the previous questions is that you need to understand that um, before getting into this field, you need to wrap up basics for yourself, what you know, and what how quickly you can learn. Um, and also, um, you should know that this field is not just about uh, one software or two. So try not to get fooled by some uh, institutions or mentors who would say to you, just join this course and everything would be fine. No, it's not you need to understand that uh, this is only you that who can um, who can spark this uh, great opportunity in your life and also you need to understand that um, having this kind of opportunity if others have succeeded in this opportunity it doesn't mean that you would succeed it too you, uh, and you need to um, understand what are your capabilities what uh, challenges you can have face and how, how um, 
can you provide the best um, sol solutions and answers to your questions that uh, any any textbook or any article any um, uh, any any kind of sources would ask uh, you need to understand them and perfectly and provide answers for them so uh, it's really um, challenging it's a lot of fun but challenging you cannot i mean the fun cam comes after solving that challenge so um, understanding all of these is a key factor in becoming successful in this field and uh, like one of the cases that uh, you really need to understand is like if your employer tells you that we need this software, uh, we need someone to do this, uh, to work with the software, you would only have one or one day or two days to work with. Also with uh, the same uh, stands for programming too. Like maybe they say, tell you that, um, okay, you need to um, do this for maybe Java or C++ or other languages. You, you need to just say, okay, I do it in two days, or that's the most of the time. I mean, that's the um, most of the time that they would give it to you. You need to do the project, so you need to be a quick learner. And um, uh, you uh, also, you need to know that uh, despite of other fields that like mechanical engineering that uh, like 30 years ago, uh, someone learned something uh, in this field and got a master's degree or PhD or whatever. And um, he's repeating the whatever he did in, in before. It's not like that in this field. This field is changing all the time. I mean, every single day that a paper or article comes out of the uh, academic uh, resources, that's going to be the solution probably for your, uh, for your problems. So um, you cannot say that, okay, I have learned this uh, product or software and I'm, I wanna stick to it. No, it's not like that. <laughs> others would learn new stuff and others would come into your um, path and they would uh, definitely get your position. So you, you definitely need to um, match your, capabilities with what the employers and companies are looking for. Mm -hmm. Okay, so constantly learning and evolve yourself, you can never stop. Involving yourself, evolving with the projects, and uh, as I mean, as the concepts and the projects are evolving, you should involve yourself too. Um, that's yeah, think... what it is. It's really, um, it's really challenging. Um, yeah. People don't have a choice, I think, these days. What, what about you, Sarah? So uh, you're doing, you did your master's and you're doing your PhD. How important is that? So in some countries, I, like I don't know in US, but in some countries, having an actual degree is very important to get you into the job. Like it's it's like you know it's like your 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 actual passport. So it's not the fact that you're actually skilled, but just to get into the job, just to get through the selection process. And then of course, everything that comes after, you will learn it by yourself. So try to get a degree, like try to see what, you know, for example, in the country you wanna apply jobs to, what is happening there, what is really needed, what is the, you know, the strict minimum. And then of course you can work in parallel on actually, you know, like training yourself to understand exactly what is happening in AI and what are the skills that you can build upon later. Mm. Okay, I really like that. I really like so to be able to set yourself up for success, you need to do your research and understand, you know, the credentials that you need, but actually the learning and the doing and the self evolving that's coming from you and, and yeah. you can only do that. Awesome. Um, so I before jumping into the Slido, I want to also ask Gianna one more question. So how did your non ML background experiences and skills translate for you? Yeah, that's a good question. And I can share a little bit about um, how my background as a writer uh, mostly helped me with learning when I was getting started. So writing has always been the way for me to learn uh, about myself first. So when I first was learning about word embeddings, 
um, during the bootcamp, I decided to write an article about it because I knew that that was going to force me to know, really know what I knew and also really know what I didn't know. Uh, so it was a good way to ask myself honest questions. Do I really understand this topic or do I merely think that I do or feel like I do? So if I got stuck or wasn't sure of something while I was writing um, the article, I would go back and read more articles to make sure I understood that very correctly or perhaps um, ask different clarifying questions. And being able to communicate with myself honestly, with honesty, um, and trying to put things down on the paper um, or a virtual paper <laughs> has helped me with learning. And not just in NLP, but anything that I was uh, trying to be better at. Um, and it doesn't even have to be like a publishable article. It can be a personal note. And it doesn't even have to be a writing. It can be like, if you want to try to teach someone um, and you'll realize how much you don't know about that topic. And so I guess better communication skill um, with myself uh, kind of resulted in better communication skill with others. Um, and well, it, it's, a, it's still, I'm still far from where I want to be in terms of communication skills, but it's an ongoing effort. And so, yeah, I would say communication was the key, most valuable um, skill that I've learned uh, from my background that, uh, that I'm still uh, benefiting a lot from. And yeah, I, I guess on a less serious note also, I just get really excited about like computer generated poems and fictions. As a poet, I think they're really fun. They're quirky. And I like to think that <clears throat> like traditional poetry and the computational poetry or AI poetics aren't too different from each other in that we don't fully understand what's really happening in the inside the black box, the black box being our mind or the algorithm. So I think it's fun. It's good to have fun and uh, good to be curious about everything and be open to experiencing different things especially when you're a beginner and not sure what you want to dedicate your time on. Um, and maybe you might be able to see some connections in the things that you've been doing in the past and the things that you're doing right now. And when you have the connection, I think that's um, when things stop feeling like work and start feeling like still work, but that's the more fun work. <laughs> mm, interesting. Okay, cool. Um, thanks for sharing that. Uh, and I guess one more question to ask would be um, would be about how to keep, and I think this is for all of you. So how to keep up with the rapid pace of research um, while juggling day-to-day -day tasks. So how and where to know about the latest trends in AI and machine learning engineer, uh, mach machine learning. Um, and I'm just going to remind everyone that this is a question that I just want you guys to rapidly or quickly answer. Um, and I'll, we'll be sending the responses like everybody here has curated a resource list um, that we're going to be sending to everyone after the session, but it would be good to just hear short responses to that. Yeah, I can go. Um, I mentioned TORS Data Science. It's a publication on Medium. Uh, it's a great resource, but also Deep Learning AI <clears throat> has this newsletter called The Batch, and you get to hear some news about uh, recent research papers or just general um, AI news. So it's really fun and digestible. Also, um, I attended a lot of events hosted by Women Who Code. They're a global network who hosts a lot of events and uh, community events. Um, they have a data science track for those women and others, anyone can participate and um, see lectures from. All right, Sarah, you wanna go next? Yeah, sure. So I actually like, I, I am, <laughs> I'm actually sus subscribed to several newsletters in like several blog posts from Medium. So I, I have like a bunch of news every day coming and I just scroll quickly through them. Like I don't read everything, I just scroll quickly. So I know what is happening and what is new. There is also the fact that I have an amazing network in LinkedIn, especially in connections. So they're always like coming up with something new or, you know, like just resuming what they have read in research. So I get to benefit from that, <laughs> thanks to them. So yeah, like, and there's actually something, I, I'm not sure if everyone knows about this, it's called Morial.ai, they're really an amazing group and they're always posting like the latest research about several subjects. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. What about you, Madhu and Farhad? Do you have final resources to throw in? Uh, as I noticed, the main resources, academic resources, uh, papers, articles, and uh, conference letters, uh, conference articles, journal papers, that those are the best ones. And uh, one of the, one of another major resource is, or, or the professors, uh, especially like, um, if I want to name one that everyone probably would know is Dr. Andre G the um, founder of Deep Learning AI and uh, a professor of Stanford University. That's the, one of the major resources. If uh, one of the articles or textbooks or notes um, he publishes, you don't want to miss that. Really, you don't want to miss that. And another good resource, as uh, Gianna said, uh, is Medium. But it depends on who uh, is the publisher and if the publisher is a person or a kind of um, publication company or organization and also who are the editors because um, whoever wants to can publish in Medium and uh, I believe to some extent that there are a lot of, uh, I mean the amount of bias in there is a lot. So um, you need to understand that. And um, other resources are kind of courses like that publish, I mean, provide that is that are provided in different resources like, like Coursera, EDX, um, and uh, Udemy, or um, other courses that have uh, analytics, Vita, I guess, is from India. And uh, whatever, if now also don't hesitate to search googling on, on internet about what what are the resources and the most top ones that appears in your i mean the first 10 ones that appear on your page those are going to be the best ones all because right all right so i want to get to the live questions thanks so we will definitely share the resources that you guys have talked about afterwards madhu will share yours as well but let's get to the live questions because we have really good ones coming in um, so I guess the first one that I can ask is for Sarah. Um, what are the best next steps after you study deep learning from online courses, for example, course area, course era. So you can say that you're employed. So then you can say that you're employable to do AI projects. So I remember what helped me actually get lots of offers from employers was actually the project I did with them then, like the first project I did with them, which was the PTSD challenge. So I think what is important is to go out there and do a real world project, you know, like not just the Kaggle ones, because the data there is already well made. There is no problem with it. You don't need to clean it, nor even think about it. So it's better to go out there and try to find real world projects and work on them. Awesome. Yes, definitely have a lot of those at Omdena and elsewhere as well. Um, all right. And then next question, uh, let's, will not having ma a master of science and PA, or sorry, yeah, master's and a PhD be of any hurdle for those who have a bachelor's degree in a technical educational field, in addition to self-learning AI? Um, so I think Gianna or Madhu, I think that would be a, a good question for you guys. Um, so, uh, as I said, uh, I'm currently uh, pursuing my bachelor's degree and I'm planning to uh, pursue my master's because, uh, as uh, Sarah also said, uh, it depends upon the region. And I saw many uh, collaborators in Omdena who are transitioning into AI uh, from a uh, quite different background who have successfully transitioned into AI and I thought the same in uh, it will work in my case but um, when I uh, contacted some of the uh, seniors or professionals uh, in the AI field in my country uh, they always suggested me to do higher education maybe because uh, that's what uh, companies need to actually uh, it's like a, uh, it, it will help us to get into AI uh, just like having a bachelor's degree will help us in getting job much easier. Uh, so as uh, I think uh, having a master's or PhD degree will help in uh, coming into uh, AI field. Uh, and 
i will also suggest you guys uh, to actually check with the region uh, from where you are living in uh, yeah. and it's not very tough though uh, you can easily contact uh, anyone who are into ai uh, through some communities or through social networking and can understand uh, so uh, what is the situation uh, in the area you are living in and then decide upon uh, like what to do next awesome yeah that's some really good advice G- giana do you have any thoughts um as coming from a from a you you're now working as a software engineer right so do you have any thoughts on how important um getting a masters is or not well well i am a software engineer and not necessarily a, a machine learning engineer or ai um profes- professional um so I'm not sure if I'll be able to give a, an accurate answer to this, but from my personal experience, um, I think having experience uh, with an Amdena project really helped me to just really understand like what it takes to be a, a machine learning engineer um, and what are the basic things that you need to be um, learning or more about. So. Yeah, that's about all that I can give. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, software engineering, machine learning engineering, AI engineering, that's all uh, kind of falling under the same umbrella, but um but yeah, that I mean getting getting hands-on in the projects that's uh that seems like a trend here. Um all right, let's get to the let's get to the next question. Um Okay, how can Okay, Sarah, this one's for you. Um, how can one get confidence to land an AI job in a company as most of us learn from courses and by solving capstones and small projects? So where do you get your confidence from? All right. So I remember like the first time I was invited to do a talk, like I wasn't expecting it. I always feared to go around and do a technical talk. And at that time, I just began learning machine learning, especially from the Stanford course. But it was enough thanks to Professor Dr. Uh, Professor Andrew, it was enough to give me confidence to actually explain the concepts that he explains so well to other people. So I think one of the things that could play a huge role into getting you anywhere, like a company or, you know, to people recognize you, is to first share what you have learned, like show people that you're, you actually master what you're, what, you, what you're talking about. And then, of course, do projects, reward projects. But it is important to share what you have what you have learned either through blog posts or do talks or even you know like mentor fellow AI enthusiasts. This will help you grow up and of course it will help you get you out there and you know like promote you to get actually you know like um, uh, I mean attract employers to you. <laughs> awesome, awesome, cool. Um, Madhu, I have a, uh, we have a question for, for you from uh, Ralit. Um, what are the biggest mistakes that you see everyone doing while learning AI? Mistakes that must be absolutely avoided at all costs. Uh, first and foremost thing is not to stuck in tutorial hell. Uh, that is one thing uh, most probably everyone is doing uh, without realizing it. Uh, and after when they realize that they were in tutorial hell, it's maybe it will be uh, six months or eight months. So uh, that's where many of my friends have also lost interest in further pursuing AI because uh, uh, at that time they they were into depression uh, that they haven't done anything except courses. So uh, that is what uh, the first one uh, I will recommend everyone not to stuck in tutorial hell. And as soon as you realize it, uh, just go and do projects and volunteer uh, to uh, to Omdena or uh, any of the uh, volunteering organizations or contributing to open source. That will actually help you uh, in many ways. The first one is networking. And second one is uh, volunteering to an open source project, uh, which, is, uh, which will help you to actually uh, reduce the fear of understanding a very large code base. And also open source people are very great and they will actually welcome you. They will help you every time and you will learn a lot from them. Um, these two are the main sessions from me uh, uh, to actually not to 
uh, get lost in uh, this field. Uh-huh. Cool. Uh, tutorial hell. I've never heard of that expression before. Sounds <laughs> interesting. <laughs> um, all right. Next question coming up uh, from Alain. Alain, uh, how do you bridge the gap between solid course foundations and the lack of industry knowledge and minimal advanced math foundations? Whoever wants to take that one, I think it's applicable to all of you. No one, no one wants to take it. So how do you bridge the, the gap between a course foundation and then you also don't have industry knowledge? Um, I mean, do you think that's possible? Can you bridge the gap between a course foundation and no industry knowledge or do you have to have a bit of both to be able to be successful? All right, Indeed, give me, uh, um, yeah, sure. We can go ahead, Farhad. No, no, no. You can. You can do this. So, in data science, one of the things that or machine learning, one of the things that people stress about, you know, like experts in the field, is the domain knowledge. It's not just you know, like knowing your data and know how to code all those models and all of that. It's actually to understand the domain knowledge, because. If you actually can't ask the right questions, of course, you you won't be able to help your data answer these questions. So it's very important to understand what is happening in that field. Let's say, for example, just to give an example, let's say, for example, you you want to classify if a mammography is just a scan for 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 you know for 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 cancer for 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 the what do we call them? Oh yeah, for the baristas, for women, yeah, to find out like if someone has an actual tumor or not. So let's say for example, like if you don't know what a tumor is and if you don't know how to read those scans, how are you going to be able to actually, you know, know if your model is actually given the right, given the right prediction or not? So this is just an example. So you have to understand, you know, like the business knowledge or the domain knowledge so you can actually deliver a good performance of course from your model. Mm -hmm. And what if you, what, so you either have to have one or the other, right? You can't have none of them. You have both. to have both. Or you can, of course, learn it throughout, you know, when you are learning about, for example, let's say you're learning about a machine learning model and you want to apply to a certain field, mm -hmm. you can try to pick both those up as you go along. Like try to read out on the medical aspects, for example, in this example, and then, of course, gain more skills from the data science aspect. Okay, awesome. Um, there's a question here for Farhad, directed at Farhad. What amount of knowledge and or experience was required for your first AI job after switching from mechanical engineering? Um, I guess I did uh, refer to those topics that I needed to do to do the first project. Those are the solid, natural kind of um, topics that you need to refer to. That's what it is. And in terms of doing, I mean, understanding what's happening in the industry, um, there are a lot of resources. One of the major ones is um, Kaggle websites and uh, website. And there are a lot of Kaggle projects out there that anyone can join to solve. And uh, as you join Kaggle, you can see what others have provided also. Also, you can post your own code and uh, you can see how great other codes are uh, in relation to your own. And you can understand um, the differences really well. And uh, that's the industry. I mean, because the money is in that uh, Kaggle website too, they, they, they do provide compensation for uh, doing the projects. So. Kaggle website is a kind of uh, typical industry resource plat or plat platform that provides uh, knowledge for you. All right. All right. Thanks. Thanks for that input. Um, we're almost wrapping up. So in order for us to get a final piece of uh, final piece of advice out there, can um, I want to throw these two questions out there. One of them is what's your next step where do you see yourself in the next five years and what final advice do you have for people trying to break into the field uh, very brief answers uh, as we're almost done i see myself in the next five years uh, that i would be responsible for different positions at the same time and including my, managing my own business in this field 
this is a really great field and you can manage it uh, after time, after hours. And uh, the, also it would provide a lot of doors into your life and you can, uh, you can open a lot of doors uh, from your own life into this field too. It's a kind of really um, bridge between you, yourself and the condition of life. Awesome. Maru? Yeah, so I would pursue my master's and then uh, I would uh, I would become a applied ML engineer uh, in, in the industry. And that's what my aim is. Uh, yeah. What's your final piece of advice for everyone? Uh, so uh, for those who want uh, who are in different field and uh, they want to uh, get into AI or the, uh, there is a problem or there is something which you want to solve uh, like uh, like the ones uh, software engineers do in uh, does in their projects and uh, if they don't have ML engineers or someone so get into some courses and do something and uh, implement it and if you want to get into research and uh, uh, like study uh, or make get into AI completely and I, I suggest you uh, to first uh, research about this domain and uh, like uh, according to your geographical location as well like uh, if it is uh, if it is asking you for uh, to get into higher education and if you don't have that uh, go for it uh, do that and also learn uh, like also learn skills uh, that actually matter as well uh, like up applied skills uh, applied ml skills and also as sarah said not only uh, it's uh, it's definitely not uh, not only about models it uh, it is also about business and business case studies as well so we need to balance the both uh, uh, we need to understand the business domain knowledge as well yeah what about you Gianna? I would say find a personal connection within the field and think about why a project that you're doing is meaningful to you. And Sarah? Okay. <laughs> so for me, like I see myself like finishing my PhD, of course, and then perhaps starting a startup that uses AI for medical health in, in my own country. So this is from my plans. And my final advice, yeah, it's great, you know, it's great to learn all about the theory and then know how to apply it. But if you don't know how to communicate the results you have come up into, you won't be able to convince anyone. And, you know, like you won't be able to, of course, acquire that dream job that you want as well. So learn as well on your, you know, like learn how to present and work on your presentation skills. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. That was great advice. Um, so I'm just going to wrap it up now. So thank you all for this insightful discussion. Um, thank you, of course, to the speakers for joining us today. Um, this brings us to the end of today's event. Uh, so thanks to everyone who has submitted your questions on Sleedo. Those were great. Um, I wish we did have more time to cover them all, but we already are over time. Um, we also hope that you guys have enjoyed today's event. Uh, we, as I said, we're going to send a follow-up email with a survey for all um, the attendees today. We would really love to hear about how we can make these events better in the future. Um, and if you don't want to miss our future events, sign up via the link in the description box below. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks, everyone.